uh, I'm the founding CEO of Locktopus, which is a website for law students. Uh, I'm a graduate of NUJS Calcutta. I graduated in 2013. Uh, and I've also written a book called Law as a Career. Uh, with me today is Professor Dr. Nigam Nagehali. He's the Dean School of Law uh, at BML Manjal University. And sir has excellent credentials. I mean, he's, he's done his law from NLS Bangalore. The destination still uh, for all the law aspirants in India. He has done his LLM from New York University. Uh, and then he did his advanced studies from uh, Oxford. Uh, really, really happy to have you here, sir. Thanks for arranging all of this. Thanks, Thanks a lot to BML, actually, for allowing me to host you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Great. Uh, guys, uh, a lot of you have joined in this webinar. I'll request you uh, just put it on the chat box, you know, maybe your name, which college are you from? If you're a school student, which school are you from? Uh, and maybe what are your expectations out of this webinar so that we can also know, you know, who all are here, get a sense of the room. I mean, we can't see all of you, but if you could introduce all of uh, if some of you could introduce yourself on the chat box, please. Okay, so uh, Dr. Nigam, I think we'll dive straight in into the conversation as well uh, as some introductions are coming in. So the talking about skills for lawyers, uh, there are some skills which have always been uh, sort of related to the law some of the skills which any legal professional can't do away with. Uh, for some of our younger audience, could you tell us what those skills are and how does someone go about developing those skills? Yeah, thank you, um, Tanuj, um, and, uh, and welcome everyone. Um, it's interesting that we are uh, talking about skills today because I think um, in some ways, um, the uh, the shift from knowledge to skills is already undergoing at various levels in our society the new education policy also is looking to the, doing the same thing so it's a very topical thing i think for uh, uh, for Tanuj, uh, for us to talk about uh, today uh, but we must not forget that uh, skills are not a new invention uh, they have been around for a long time and i think um, your first question kind of alludes to that you know the the idea that lawyers need skills is not a new invention or not something it's not a novelty it's something that we have always thought about and it's it's just that it's not been emphasized in the same fashion as it's being emphasized um, today um, and you mentioned uh, you you started your question by saying um, what kind of skills that are there that lawyers cannot do without right and, um, and there are a number of them and i can just mention two uh, just to begin with and then we can expand on that um, and talk about it further down the line. Uh, the first thing, and I've said this before at various fora, is um, an ability to communicate well, right? It's really, that's a very important part of the lawyer's repertoire, uh, an ability to write well, especially, not just speak well, but write well. Uh, and and, and, uh, and uh, by writing well, or how to write well, I mean how to write uh, precisely, accurately, um, and with conviction. Um, it's important that these are not skills that people think um, can develop organically um, without any uh, training. Actually, it takes a huge amount of training, not just in law school, but after as well, for uh, people to develop these skills. You know about that, Tanoj, with your own experience, uh, both uh, at NEJS and later when you founded Octopus and any law academic, I think. Would, uh, uh, would appreciate this point. So that's one kind of traditional thing that I think lawyers need to be able to uh, do, which is to communicate well, be persuasive. Uh, and as I said, it's not, uh, the art of communication is something that uh, needs, even five years is not enough for, for a lawyer or law student to develop those kind of skills. Uh, and, the, and I'll just talk about one more skill, which is, um, uh, which sometimes uh, we forget, um, and but which is kind of, one of those skills that's been in place for the last 20, 25 years since the NLU movement started, which is the skills of synthesis, right? You mm -hmm. synthesize information from various sources. So we teach, um, you know, BLLB, BBLLB, and now more recently, BSC LLB and BCOM LLB and, mm -hmm. and all these combinations. And these combinations are not being taught for effect. 
um, or, um, or, or for any peripheral reasons. They are taught because we believe that a lawyer's expertise is enhanced if he or she is able to synthesize various domains of knowledge, both within the legal field, as well as between the law and other disciplines. So a person who knows economics and the law is better off in the law for that reason. Uh, a person who knows business management and the law is better off because of that reason. So that idea of synthesizing various parts of uh, various domains of knowledge and skills is I think an important part for being uh, uh, a lawyer and almost any kind of big ticket issues that you talk about um, in, um, in, in, the, in India today actually involve some synthesis or the others. And you know, so uh, if you're talking about telecom com companies being asked uh, by the government to pay their dues, I mean, that is a synthesis of a lot of issues, including spectrum and um, uh, ratios and taxes. And so you need to know a lot of things in, um, in different uh, parts of your knowledge spectrum for you to understand how to put that all together and say something uh, and do something valuable for your client. So to start off, I think it's important for us to realize skills of communication and skills of synthesis are, are extremely important um, for a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, I mean, writing, which you mentioned first, is sort of a skill which is probably crucial for any knowledge professional, or uh, not, not just lawyers. Uh, how, how would you suggest that someone who's young, let's say a school student interested in the law, or maybe even young law students, how can they go about developing writing skills, especially when, you know, in most colleges in India, you don't get, let's say, good faculty members or personalized attention uh, to such things, you know, what would your, your advice be for students? So you're on mute. Sorry, I think if you don't get um, passionate faculty and mm -hmm. personalized attention, mm -hmm. it's a pity. I think, you, I think a good law school needs that. Um, um, and it's important that um, the law school faculty is in, invested in this idea of enhancing the writing skills of its students. Mm -hmm. If the law school faculty is not invested in this, mm -hmm. it's not gonna work, right? So it's very important that, uh, first of all, that the law school faculty believes in um, ensuring that they give the type of education, not just in their assessments, but in the way they practice their teaching, in the way they interact with the students, that they focus on the writing. When I say writing, I mean analytical reasoning and able to express your thoughts persuasively, clearly, precisely, all the stuff that we've been talking about when it comes to accurately, when we talk about uh, uh, writing skills. That's one. Second, in today's world, Tanuj, as you will very well know, mm -hmm. I'll say why I say as you will very well know, there are plenty of avenues for somebody to practice their skills, so their writing skills. It's only through practice that you can develop it. And there are plenty of avenues. On your website, you have, on a daily basis, a uh, number of competitions being advertised, um, either counseling, mood codes, essay writing, um, and all of this judgment writing. And all of this involves some kind of writing or the other. So. I mean, it's a no-brainer that uh, today a student doesn't have to only confine himself or herself to the classroom. It's he or she can go outside of the classroom and practice their writing unless they practice it in some kind of a setting where they get some feedback. In any competition, they'll get some feedback. Um, it's, of, it's of no use. They need to have some feedback though. Mm. Uh, but, but I must, with this caveat, that that won't be enough, that the law school faculty has to be invested in ensuring that uh, the right well. Right, right, sir. And so you also mentioned about synthesis and there, you know, we, we can turn to maybe the good old debate of, uh, you know, specialization versus let's say having a range of skills. Uh, again, you know, for students, school students planning a career in law or even law students, uh, you know, thinking five years down the line, would you suggest specialization or specialization should come later? Uh, and how do you balance, how do you, how do you address this debate of you know, specialization versus range of skills? Th thank you for mentioning this because I, um, I, think, that, I think the debate is real. I mean, there is, a, so there is some substance to the debate. I'm not saying the debate is, uh, is, is a misnomer. Mm -hmm. 
but the debate is being presented in a slightly misleading fashion. Mm -hmm. It takes years for somebody to specialize in any area of law. And uh, I don't recommend that students think about specialization very early in their career, certainly not in law school, but also not very early in their career. Right? I think they should do it once they get comfortable with the practice of law. Um, um, so it, it's not something they need to decide immediately. And certainly they shouldn't decide immediately because I don't think that it works that way. But, uh, but, I, but I agree with, with the idea that uh, once you do decide on, on specialization, it takes years of effort to become a specialist. So I know that, for example, I'm a tax professor. It took me years to get to the stage where I'm comfortable with the practice of uh, tax. Uh, I, I don't think if I had uh, done a, uh, if I'd gone into all kinds of other areas, I would have been um, uh, proficient in, 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 in one area in tax. So I understand that part, right? Mm -hmm. But spe specialization shouldn't be, the idea of specialization shouldn't be taken too far, right? The, in any particular area of law, unless you have a grounding in other areas, you can't succeed. So you can't be a good tax professor or a good tax lawyer unless you know property law and contract law and corporate law. And unless you know the foundations of those subjects well, you can't make headway in, in tax, right? Uh, and vice versa. So unless you, if you're a good corporate lawyer, you're a good corporate lawyer because you know contracts, you know securities, you know investment law. So it's important therefore that we don't take this idea of specialization too far. Uh, a law, the whole idea of the law is it's interconnected. All the domains are interconnected. And that's what I meant by synthesis, that skill of synthesizing uh, various information, various pieces of information together needs to be inculcated right from the beginning. Right, so, and so, sort of building upon your point that students nowadays maybe tend to try to specialize a bit early into their uh, careers. Uh, your good friend, Mr. Murli Neel Kanthan, uh, I was interviewing him for my book. What he told me was that, hey, you know, students nowadays are focusing on the fancy areas of law things like sports law or cyber law, uh, even intellectual property law. And, you know, he mentioned the same things, you know, which, which you are uh, saying. That See, all, 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 all old people think the same way. <laughs> right, right. And I think, yeah, I mean, this is, this is where young people need to learn as well. Uh, you know, that, hey, you know, what is sports law about? It's about, you know, effectuating maybe contracts largely in the sporting industry, right? Uh, so all of the young people, uh, you know, try try getting the first principles of law, uh, you know, set basically before you jump on to the to the advanced areas. Uh, sure, sir. So I mean, uh, so sorry, sorry, Tanush. Can I just uh, step in and say a bit more about what you just now said? So um, I think what you're what I think Murli was talking about and what you're talking about as well is that the the categories of um, legal um, concepts don't change too much. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the circumstances in which they're applied that change. So the idea of responsibility in tort law is not going to become transformative. What, what happens is you apply responsibility, the idea of responsibility to new, new areas, including new areas of technology, um, AI, et cetera. But you apply those old concepts mm -hmm. to these kind of new areas. And so unless you have a good grounding in those concepts, you can't really extend it to the new area. So I think that's what we are, that's what we have been trying to say. But so you need two skills. You need the skills to, you need kind of that, that proper grounding in domain knowledge of what responsibility means. Um, and uh, you also need some additional domain knowledge in the new area. So if you don't know um, technology, um, and for example, Murli is a good example. Murli knows a lot about intellectual property, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, you might call it a newfangled area, but he knows that area very well. And therefore he's able to apply the old concepts to those new areas. Mm -hmm. So th that's what we meant. What we meant was if you, we, we don't think of sports law or um, IP law as um, something fashionable for the sake of it. It's just that it, it uh, presents us with a challenge, which is the old ways of thinking how do we apply that now in the new context? And that skill the students have to learn in, in law school. Right. That's a wonderful nuance. Of, I mean, great way of thinking around this entire issue. Uh, so the other thing is, we, we've spoken about the skills which are generally required for any lawyer. And I think we have a couple of things that you mentioned are writing and synthesis. Now, so coming to the 21st century lawyer uh, and 
is there anything in particular they need to be wary about or they need to think through any particular skills or even mindsets that they need to develop uh, yeah i think um are you saying are you saying some kind of new um, ways of approaching the practice of law or the practice of legal education right. in the new era um yeah i think a few things i think uh, should be kept in mind um um one one is that i think a lot of this kind of um, uh skills of innovation are very important today right so we have a rapid uh, the one thing that's changed since i was a student is the um is the um, rapid um, technological transformation that's taking place right so technology was transforming our lives even when i was a student i'm not that old right mm -hmm. but the rate at which it is transforming has changed right i mean it's exponential now right so what's happening um, uh, within a generation we are seeing um, kind of landmark technological changes right? so ai for example which had very little role to play uh, in the past even in the past say 10 years is now playing a very important role in in all areas i'm not talking about legal practice i'm just saying in all areas of business right and uh, some domain knowledge of data science and process management and uh, blockchain and artificial intelligence now i think is inevitable for every law school right? mm -hmm. so that's a new kind of skill that we're talking about now that is a very hard thing to do because uh, law schools don't hire those kind of people to teach mm -hmm. these things right so uh, so that that's going to be the tough transition i think that those skills are very hard to acquire i think and that's where we'll find a bit of uh, um, i think a bit of churn uh, in 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 the way legal education is going to be uh, imparted uh, in the present and in the future right so that's one uh, important thing the second thing might sound so this is the first thing yeah, that this kind of comfort level with technology is mm -hmm. uh, and the skills associated with that i think is important mm -hmm. but then second thing i'm going to say is going to sound a bit old fashioned mm -hmm. to your ears but um, uh, i think it's um, uh, is is sort of new fangled and i'll tell you why why i'm saying that and that's a skill of empathy right idea that um, we have to work together in order for each one of us in a project to succeed right? has never been taught in law schools never been taught uh, and when i said taught it never been ingrained in law schools right i mean you went to any js i went to nls any nlu student will tell you that a uh, law is a very lonely discipline and it's a very kind of almost a zero sum game you know, where mm -hmm. people are out there to do things for themselves you, you even see in legal academia for example people there's hardly anybody writes articles jointly i mean people write they basically sole authors of knowledge right mm -hmm. which is completely different in economics and management and sciences I and mean, you hardly see a sole author in an in an academic piece in engineering or science or technology so the idea that we are able to somehow empathize with each other and work towards a common project while seemingly old fashioned is actually very new for law students and lawyers right it's a very new thing for us right mm -hmm. and somehow we are that that skill um, we're all st still struggling with that skill we're still trying to figure out how to ensure that we kind of somehow impart the skill to young lawyers and law students because if because you i know from my experience you know from your experience a person who can be a good team player and who's able to empathize with his uh, colleagues is uh, actually one of the best professionals to have on the team right uh, but how do we get to that stage is is a struggle for legal education and for um, employers yeah and so i mean <clears throat> slightly related is bar council of india recently made mediation as a compulsory subject across law schools and so you also pointed out that let's say management journals or knowledge production in management fields engineering fields it tends to have maybe more co-authorships versus the legal field is there anything inherent in the legal field especially maybe in litigation which actually makes the structure of legal system and legal education uh, as you said you know a zero sum game uh, do you think there is any correlation or yeah i so why do we why do we have you know lesser production of co-authorships in law 
No, I think it's uh, uh, it's just a legacy game. I think it's just legacy. I think people are just people have been doing that for a long time, and people and therefore people are doing it. So sort of an inertia. People are doing it, continue to do it. I don't think it has to be the case. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, litigation may be slightly different, mm -hmm. uh, but if you go out of the litigation area, um, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, hopefully litigation, uh, traditional litigation, will. Um, will not have this kind of overwhelming influence on the legal field as it is now. You said BCI, for example, as you know, BCI is uh, talking about mediation, but arbitration is coming in as well in a big way. And I think we are seeing a sea change in the way people um, think about the law um, and uh, think about the law more as a team effort rather than as an individual effort. So I think to answer your question, the law as, uh, as uh, individualism is a legacy issue, I think. It's not an inherent value or inherent feature of the law. Mm -hmm. Right. So I mean, so so we have spoken about writing, we have spoken about synthesis, then technology and empathy. How do law schools go about, you know, developing these? And so maybe since you are the dean at BML Munjal, uh, could you tell us some of the things which your college has done uh, to sort of incorporate these into the curriculum or generally to, to have students imbibe these uh, in their five years? So when I um, started the law school, um, my first, um, my, my, my really my first purpose was to kind of emphasize a lot on both the traditional and the kind of the newfangled skills you're talking about mm -hmm. and do it in a different way from what has been done before. So I think, for example, writing is really important. Mm -hmm. um, writing requires a lot of personal attention and feedback a lot of rigor and I've tried to do that for each of the courses in our law school. So all our law school courses um, are uh, basically right from the first year, first semester, are pretty much open book exams, right? I mean, so we have assessments, but if a person who comes in um, to the law school, uh, he or she is asked to write in not in that kind of mugged up way that they've been doing in their schools, but to kind of respond creatively to problems given, and right from the first semester, we don't we don't account for we don't say they're kids, and therefore they have to be handled with kid gloves, and and we should we should give them some time. We don't do that because we think that if you don't inculcate this culture right from the beginning, it's not going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So we um, so we and, and there's always some you know there's always a, a bit of a, a, a taken aback kind of thing. You know, say say how do we do this? You know, we've never been taught to uh, we've been never been taught to be creative. Uh, we've never been taught to apply things mm -hmm. and uh, that's uh, of course uh, uh, a comment on our legal on our education system right? and hopefully that will change with the new education policy so the first thing we do at, at, at munjal is we uh, we have this rigor of uh, writing and think thinking independently and good feedback that, that they receive from their teachers but I mean, that's a traditional Part of, and I'm trying to say that traditional skill we are trying to develop right from the right from the beginning. It's not easy um, mm -hmm. doing uh, changing students' mindsets um, at a at a, at a, at a time when they're already 17, 18 years old. It's hard, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they are used to a certain way of doing things, and to kind of change that almost drastically, in the, it, it, it's hard. But we have that's a challenge. But it's something that we have to do if we want to develop them into good lawyers. The, um, our law school, uh, our university, our law school is part of a university that has an engineering school, which is five years old already. So that's the oldest part of the university, mm -hmm. oldest part of a young university. Mm -hmm. And there's a management school, which is equally old. And so we are fortunate therefore to have talent, academic talent in the engineering and technology side of things and in the business and management side of things. And we are already drawing on that. So we are already drawing on our school of management to offer their business management courses to our students, um, their economics courses to our students. And we hope to do the same thing for technology. As the students progress uh, in their future years, we want to draw on the engineering side of our law school to kind of give them, as I told you, the kind of technological skills that when I was a student, I didn't really kind of need because the rate of change wasn't that swift, but I think we need that today uh, at the rate at which things are being transforming. But finally, this your question about uh, uh, doing something in teams and emphasizing with your colleagues, it's very hard to teach that. Right? Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. So we have joined, uh, we sometimes have joined projects. We of course have good legal aid programs uh, for them. Mm -hmm. uh, our constitutional law classes teach them what it means um, to be in a country where a vast majority are not nearly as privileged as the students are. But in order to actually get them to um, acquire that skill of empathy, it's very hard. So that's, I'm still struggling with it. I don't have an answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know when I'll have an answer to it, but that's an ongoing ongoing quest. Right, sir, right. Uh, so, so we talked about the input side of things, which is, let's say what a law school can do. Uh, the output, you know, is measured largely through recruitments, uh, you know, of all these efforts that are being implemented by a, by a legal education institute. And so you recently did a, a wonderful sort of a study with Wahura, which is perhaps India's foremost uh, recruitment, legal recruitment organization. Uh, so could you tell us what, and you know, I think that was on a, a very similar theme, theme about you know, the next generation lawyer. So any, any curious or interesting findings from that report or any? Um, yeah, so the output side of things, uh, before I go to Wahura, I just want to mention something on this output side because that triggered uh, something that's very important, I think, for law, incoming law students work and for law students in general, which are internships. Right? So we make sure that uh, right from the first semester uh, that, they, um, that we take internships seriously. And by taking, it doesn't matter really where you work in the first two years. It may matter later on. It may matter in the third year and the fourth year and the fifth year. Um, but it doesn't really matter where you work or, or, or the nature of work, but how you work matters a lot, right? Whether you, you're diligent in your work, professional, time sensitive, effective, um, comprehensive, error free, and you're able to work with the teammates that we were talking about. So the internships captures that, by the way. So we have internship feedbacks that we receive from the, uh, from the places they go to, where we talk about, our, where we ask them this question. How did the student engage with the, with the other interns? Um, so there we do capture this uh, this teamwork idea that we've been talking about. So we take internships. So internships are taken very very seriously. Now I believe things. I mean because internships are not taken. I mean they've taken seriously when I was in NLS, but it wasn't you know a kind of thought that goes into internships now wasn't present when I was a student. But I believe things have changed. I mean uh, you know uh, people take people. There's some thought that goes into into how internships are managed. But at Munjal, we, we actually take that, of course, we take it seriously, because for us, it's important that that experiential part of that education is given equal uh, prominence, right? Now, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I, I, I got this habit of a professor, I digress from all the topics that you, that you no, that's asked. Wonderful. These are wonderful digressions, sir. I'm, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> right, so, so I was going to do just one more digression, therefore, uh -huh. before we go, go to go to Wahura, which is that you talked about outputs, but I want to, um, and I, this is kind of a favorite rant of mine, so I'll, I'll mention this here, right here. My problem with a lot of young generation of law students is that they have, for some reason, acquired a very transactional view of education. You know, they've decided that education means I put in X amount of effort and money, and then I need X amount of benefits, rewards, and money out of it. Right? It's a completely wrong way of looking at education. Education is not just not just as from a principal point of view, not from the not just from the point of view of saying. Um, you know, this ought not to be the way you should do things. But even from a pragmatic point of view, even from the career point of view, it's the wrong way to look at it. Right? The right way to look at it is to say, I'm going to acquire these skills. I'm going to become a better lawyer by becoming a better writer, better communicator, uh, an innovative person, a person can synthesize information, a person who acquires the skills to actually complete a transaction. It's very hard, by the way, for all of us to complete the task that we are asked to do. Right? So it's very important that the person focuses on that. All your rewards and money and all those things will follow afterwards. Right? But so therefore, I, I, I'm, I'm asking all the law students and all the students who are listening to me today uh, that please don't have a, I mean, please avoid, if the problem is this peer pressure, please avoid a transactional view of, of education. Education is, this is the greatest time of your life. I mean, we would all love to be in your position, you know? So uh, use this time to acquire those skills in a pleasurable and joyful environment, an environment where you're not 
worried unnecessarily about what what pay grade you're going to get at the end of this uh, of this internship or this five year study that's not that's not if you look at it that way principally i think it's there's a problem but even pragmatically there's a problem you know you will start it, it'll kind of take away the fact that you want to actually acquire skills in a more relaxed in a more purposive environment where you are able to focus you actually enjoy reading the law and applying the law right get once you get that habit where you actually like the law right a lot of other things will fall right? so this is my you know my digression so sorry i just wanted to mention it with regard to output right this is what so i wanted to just say that, that this is something i always I always mention um, um uh, before i before i start talking about outputs right but otherwise outputs looks like a very kind of uh, instrumental thing you know uh, and i don't want students to think of it uh, that way but that's just a wrong way of thinking about it uh, when you're uh, when you're trying to enjoy the law or, or like the law mm. um the uh, now let's talk about outputs right? yeah. so <laughs> the, the the wahura um, uh, bmu survey that we did so we teamed up with wahura thinking um, let's do something different let's ask the lawyers mm. what kind of uh, Uh, lawyers they want right let's ask the law firms litigators in our councils if if you wanted good lawyers what did you mean by that right it looks like this question which has always been relevant has not been asked before properly right so it's like one of the first surveys to actually do that probably the first survey um, to do it so we we interviewed you know nearly 200 lawyers um, asked for their input and some of the answers were expected some of them were surprising the expected answer so they're saying we need people who know the fundamentals of the law uh, we need people who can communicate well uh, we need uh, uh, people who have good domain knowledge um, uh, and uh, and those kind. so those are all answers i think um, which which were i mean i would have expected it right it just confirmed my idea that this is what uh, law firms need uh, what litigators need there were some surprising answers uh, and by surprising in the way that Uh, a lot of lawyers were actually worried about technology right? um and they were saying that look technology uh, there's going to be a huge transformation of the legal industry at all levels and we want our young lawyers who come into the profession to be prepared for it and the other surprising thing was their emphasis on soft skills so they were saying a person should be able to manage their project very well a person should be able to get along with their uh, colleagues Uh, a person should have commercial awareness right? is a very important thing right so and i think uh, commercial awareness uh, when people say that it's code for saying you need to know the business side of things you know, if you if you talk about if you're in the trucking industry you need to do a little bit of trucking you need if you are in software industry you need to know technology you need to know software how software systems work in order to be a better lawyer um if you are in um, medicine uh, or pharmaceuticals you need to know a lot more about that area in order to become a better lawyer uh, and and so this kind of commercial awareness idea uh, struck us as something quite important uh, as part of this kind of new age skills or the new way of looking at practicing lawyers lawyers being part of the business basically uh, and therefore uh, requiring those kind of additional skills in order to uh, become better lawyers so for us the bahura survey was important because it gave us a glimpse into not just where legal the legal profession is going but therefore where should the legal education go right? where should the where should the new trends go and i think and we had a very good we got we had a very good set of panels across the board so we had um, menaka guruswami from litigation we had rajiv lutra from the law firm side we had raul martin from technology and so we had a very good uh, set of people who uh, who are uh, kind of uh, thought leaders in their areas they are actually trying to figure out what to do um, in these new areas so it's quite interesting from that point of view right uh, so maybe we can now take a few of the uh, questions which are coming from the audience i've noted uh, sure sure uh, and i think one of the points uh, which which we mentioned in the in the webinar description was the llm from abroad and right. suga she wants to know uh, a slightly broader question maybe which is how do you compare llm from india versus an llm from abroad uh, what would you say uh, are the pros and cons of of these programs um i mean an llm from abroad i mean there are two things to this uh, one is that often 
LLMs from abroad have an emphasis on um, research that's missing in LLMs in India. Uh, and I think so. Um, um, I was just uh, I was just reading a book by Saikat Majumdar on um, colleges, and what struck me, and uh, we were talking about it uh, as, as with some friends as well. And what struck me there was that his experience was uh, when he went abroad, uh, he was an English uh, literature major. So when he went abroad, he, in terms of knowing his uh, English authors, uh, the, the, all the, the pantheon of famous English authors wasn't an issue for him. The issue for him was uh, he didn't uh, know enough about research methods in social sciences, right? Mm -hmm. How to write a paper. And I think there's some resonance of that in my experience when I went, when I went abroad uh, to do my LLM, uh, um, both in England and the US. Uh, and I think the, the idea is that domain knowledge uh, 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 it's not so much of an issue. How to kind of apply that and do your research and do your citations and do your rigor in, um, uh, in, uh, in analysis as understood by other people, your audience, those kind of things, I think the LLMs abroad do better for now. It may be changing a little bit, but for now, research methods and writing is done better uh, abroad, right? Well, that's one, but that's that's one only one part of the LLM experience, right? The other part of LLM experience is you're abroad, and right? I mean you're you're in the US or in the UK. You have a certain peer group. You're looking at uh, 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 your your classmates. You're looking at your uh, rock star teachers. You're looking at uh, great lawyers and law firms, and that permeates your um, your mind, uh, the way you start looking at things very differently, right? So it's a great for exposure to those kind of things which are intangible. They can't be, I can't say it in one, two, three, I can't say it in the form of formula here, but those intangible benefits of being um, in a place that's buzzing with uh, excellence and with lots of really articulate people and uh, driven people, that that kind of environment I think is, is, is again missing in the LLMs in India, right? And so that, in, that kind of intangible environment as well is very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the LLM abroad, uh, they also have this additional element of costs. Uh, a lot of times they are unaffordable to many. Uh, in that case, how do you think someone can go about selecting an LLM in India? Should they give, go on the basis of a college? Is it more like a PhD where you are largely selecting your supervisors or your faculty? How can someone go about choosing a good LLM program? in India? I think you should look at the faculty. Mm -hmm. I think faculty is paramount. And LLM is also a research, uh, there's a, an element of LLM that's uh, heavily focused on research as compared to the undergrad LLM. Therefore, you must look at the kind of research resources of the university, uh, their library resources, uh, the kind of people who are working there. Um, is there some research going on there already? In fact, do they have PhD scholars? Um, in which case they should be able to guide uh, LLMs. PhD scholars are an important peer group for the LLMs, right? Uh, often enough, you're not just guided by your teachers, um, you're guided by your seniors, as it's happened to all of us. And so it's important to have good PhD uh, culture there at that school for a good uh, law school to develop. But I think most importantly, good faculty, good research resources. Um, I think that's important in choosing an LLM. Right. Uh, and we had Naman, Naman, you had said in the Q&A box that you were a school student, that you were wondering if you could ask questions, please feel free. I mean, this webinar is for you. So just key in your questions on the Q&A box. And my request to others as well is just put in your questions on the Q&A box. We'll try to address as many as, many as we can, uh, but currently there are too many questions, there are 30 plus questions. Uh, sure. So, so Monisha is asking, you for uh, advice to your younger self. Uh, you know, are there any mistakes, uh, any detours which you took in your journey? Would you correct them? Would you, would you not? Uh... <laughs> That's a tough question, actually. <laughs> um, so, as she asked, uh, have I got any regrets? In uh... so, so it's it's uh, advice for your younger self, maybe right. your twenty-year-old self. Okay. Um, I think I could have written more. I think uh, 
I made the same mistake that a lot of uh, young people make today, which is that um, they uh, they strive at perfection. Right? And so they they think that if they can't write something good immediately, they can't write at all. And I think that's um, that's a common mistake. Uh, I think um, you should write as as much as possible. Uh, and doesn't matter what the output is, um, it'll get better. But the only way it can get better is by practice. Uh, so I wish I had, I mean, I write a lot more now than I used to write earlier. Uh, and it should have been the other way around. I should have been writing a lot more earlier. Uh, so that's one, I think that's one advice to my, my, my younger self. The other advice to my younger self, which I kind of gave already, I think in some way, is that um, not to get too perturbed by this talk of, uh, you know, career and, uh, which law firm you're going to, which salary grade you're in. I think that would be uh, another advice I would give. I think uh, I think young people are so influenced, almost psychologically influenced by their peers in this respect that I feel bad for them. You know, I think it's really important that people first are happy, right? I mean, this is a lesson that's never provided in law schools. And it's certainly not provided in this uber competitive law schools of which you and I are a part, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, and I think it's really bad for young people and they come out, uh, it's, it's, it, they come out as individuals who then are, uh, they might be successful or quasi successful, but most importantly, they're still unhappy, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's really important for students to um, have some, uh, recognize some inherent value in law, legal practice, to enjoy it. To en so if you start enjoying legal writing, or you start enjoying legal analysis, or you start enjoying drafting, or you start enjoying talking about the law, that would serve you much better throughout your life than thinking about how this particular thing will help you achieve something, right? Mm -hmm. I think that will, that, that is a, a kind of, a, that, that's a kind of game in which if you start uh, playing a part, uh, you, you run the danger of then start comparing yourself to other people and then, then it just goes downhill from there. And I think that, that we shouldn't be doing that. And I think a lot of lawyers and law students today are, uh, are more unhappy than they should be. I, I, think, I think that we should really be careful about. And so this idea which you've sort of planted is that about enjoying the law, enjoy reading the law, writing about the law. For a lot of us, you know, it, we would struggle to see or imagine how enjoying tax law, what could enjoying tax law mean? So sir, if you could tell us, like when you are going through a, a judgment maybe, or what, what are the things that you enjoy about tax law? And there was a question about, you know, a tax law as a career, but what do you enjoy about it? And if you could express it, I mean, it might be difficult, but just so that, you know, some of us start thinking in, in those terms, what could enjoyment of law mean? Yeah, so um, first of all, Tax law is a great career. Uh, it's um, uh, I'm being instrumental here, but it's uh, lucrative, um, and there are not that many tax lawyers around, right? So, and tax laws will never go away, right? So, as long as we have the we have the government, we're going to have taxes. So, uh, whatever rapid technological change might occur, it doesn't matter to the government. They'll still tax people, and they'll still tax transactions. So, uh, it, uh, so tax law is is a, is a great field to get into, uh, in terms of its importance to uh, society and its importance to your future clients. Um, in terms of enjoyment, tax law is actually contrary to how it's perceived by many people. It's actually one of the most, it, it's, it's kind of thing that you can really sink your teeth into, right? Because it's legislation that's often convoluted and counterintuitive. Right? So it's both convoluted and counterintuitive, right? So it doesn't make sense. And it's uh, needlessly uh, complex, but that's kind of stuff is is uh, is uh, uh, fertile material for mm -hmm. you to kind of really get into this basic legal concepts. So I was just teaching NLS students capital gains law two weeks ago, and I'm writing some a piece on it as well. And one of the basic things in capital gains law, you'd imagine with all this complexity, Section 45 of the Income Tax Act, and all this complicated, sir. the real basic foundational problem in capital gains law is the idea of transfer of property, right? The very idea, just, just, the question is, there is a capital gains tax because there's a transfer of property, right? And both the idea of what property is and what a transfer is, is still not settled, right? And so there are lots of nice conceptual issues on, on that. Uh, and, uh, and anyone who thinks, um, 
uh, deeply about these issues, realizes that these are just the kind of things that you can write uh, and read about uh, and really enjoy. It. I, mean, I mean, so uh, I think uh, uh, Tanuj is giving tax law as hopefully not just uh, as a single instance. He's giving that as an example, yeah. what might be uh, an arcane area of law or, or, or a complex area of law, but could be actually enjoyable. And so you, uh, what better uh, example than uh, than Lord Denning, who's written judgments in all areas of law, right? I mean, Lord Denning wrote judgments on tenancy law in the UK. And th those are classic, interesting, beautifully written literature. Right, uh, his uh, uh, judgment on uh, uh, promissory estoppel in the high trees case is a piece of uh, literature in some ways. Right, it is the way he expands on what promissory estoppel is in um, in uh, and how it differs from uh, contract, um, and, and so and it, and then he follows up follows that up with other cases. All his writings on uh, interpretation of statutes, on statute interpretation, he weaves basically he does it by weaving stories. Right. His, uh, and therefore, and therefore, one thing I want uh, our students to do is actually not just read our high court and Supreme Court judgments, which unfortunately follow a slightly boring pattern of, you know, facts and then what one lawyer has said, what the other lawyer has said, and then conclusion. Um, but see other ways of writing judgments, right? Denning's judgments. Actually, just read Denning's judgments. Right? Mm -hmm. If you just read Denning's judgment, uh, you will start thinking about. Um, how beautifully somebody can analyze the law, right? and you start liking that. Right? So that's very or, or or Bingham's Lord Bingham's judgments. Uh, so just see how they um, they uh, analyze the law, and uh, and you will start realizing that uh, um, that kind of reasoning and that kind of thinking about the law is actually enjoyable. Right? It's actually worth reading. Right. Right. I mean, so you you calling judgments as pieces of literature clearly shows that, you know, why and how maybe you are also enjoying the law. Uh, great to hear that, sir. Uh, so, okay, so we, we're going to have varied questions now. So Divyakshi Jain is asking, and I think it's a, it's a question on everyone's mind on the chat box. Uh, does it matter if you are from, if you're not from a famous university or NLUs, uh, does this affect future prospects? I mean, I think if you're from a famous uh, top five NLU, right, it certainly gives you a leg up. I mean, then, you know, uh, employers look at you in a certain way. Um, your internships are easier to obtain. Uh, but that's, you know, all that's a very small factor in the success of an individual uh, student, law student, uh, eventually. Right? Eventually, a lot of law students will get internships. Uh, a lot of sincere, hardworking law students will get internships, which will give them opportunities. It's how they make use of those internships that will make a difference. Right? Eventually, all law students, in my opinion, will get an opportunity. All sincere, hardworking law students will get an opportunity uh, to enter the career, uh, enter the law firm business in some way or the other. It's how they make use of that opportunity that's important. So um, in India, in the legal, in the Indian ecosystem, um, I, I believe that the top five NLUs will give you an initial leg up, um, but that's just an initial leg up. I think everything else will really depend on how that law student does and also what kind of system that law student has been exposed to in their law, in whatever law school they went to, right? Um, have their faculty taken an interest in them? Have the faculty made them well-rounded individuals, you know, individuals who, um, who are able to, in a sober and mature fashion, think and write about the law, right? That is what's important. If somebody, they, you're um, uh, one year down the law, one year after law school, nobody's gonna care too much about which law school you went to. And so after that, it's a question of a well-rounded personality in the law, how you're able to react to things. Right, so, and so talking about well-rounded personalities, I mean, uh, we have a question again from Manisha Sain about mooting. Uh, does mooting help you in your career? Should one moot? And so a lot of this, uh, these questions around mooting sometimes, uh, and I'm not talking about Manisha's particular question, also stems from the fact that some people relate to themselves as let's say introverts 
uh, they think mooting is this loud adversarial sort of a contest, which they cannot be a part of. Uh, so, so, I mean, the one broader question about, you know, you said that communication is important. Is sort of being an extrovert, is sort of public speaking, is that crucial for law? And then, sir, is, is mooting important? Uh, how can someone get comfortable in mooting if they need to do that? Yeah, mooting is, um, unfortunately, does favor um, people who are comfortable with public speaking. Mm. Uh, and therefore, uh, people who are introverts uh, may find it hard. But mooting is just uh, one of the ways in which uh, you can Im improve your skills. Right. So there are various other ways of doing it. You can write well, write good articles. If you apply to a law firm and the law firm uh, has seen that you've written a brilliant article on um, promise estoppel or damages in contract law, I think that'll be as useful as if they're seeing you've done a good moot uh, somewhere. So I think, I think moot courts are just one way of expressing and improving your talents of communication. In fact, in my opinion, mooting is in some ways an inferior way of improving your communication skills. I think a much better way of improving it is by writing well. Mm -hmm. But so in my opinion, the importance of mooting is not so much in that. The importance of mooting for me is it improves your mental strength, right? You're able to go out there, you know, you have to go to an alien and usually an alien environment, right? An environment you're not used to. You have to go before somebody you would, you a stranger who you don't know, he doesn't know you, your reputation he doesn't care about. He doesn't know where you're from or how good you are. And you had to convince him about your argument. Mooting shows you how life can be very unfair. On that day, on some, you'll get one cranky judge who doesn't really believe what you're saying. So mooting helps you. It really improves you. It toughens you mentally, mm -hmm. right? And in my days, maybe not in your days, in my days, you had to travel by train to some place, that rickety train journey. So all those things, you know, it's a it, uh, it really improves you, it, it, it toughens you up. And it, it's important, as I said, the well-rounded personality. It's important, therefore, that, and so it's important, therefore, that you use the moods to get out there, right? The more you get out, the more you talk to people, the more you put yourself in alien environments, environments that are not comfortable, the more you prosper, the more you learn, right? So mood codes from that angle, I always liked, even though I, I, I'm one of those people who didn't like mood codes. Right. Uh, I ended up, I, I, I was part of a team that represented uh, India at the Jessup competition. So in, in the end, I, I, I kind of uh, bit the bullet and, and did all this mooting. But I never liked mooting. Uh, I, I just thought mooting was, I, I thought mooting had too many, um, uh, it, it, it laid too much emphasis on oral argument, which can always be, you know, somebody can just say something very quickly without really kind of going into a subject and get away with it. So it, it emphasizes too much on oral argument. And it's there's a bit of there's a lot of luck involved, right? So you the kind of judge you have that day, the kind of opponents you have that day. So I always used to think moot courts is like so it was like T20 for me. You know, it wasn't a, there's no it was not a test match, right? Yeah. But um, uh, I got a lot of out of mooting for other reasons, how I managed with my teammates you know, uh, uh, how I was able to go and do things which I wasn't used to outside the classroom. Those kind of things, mooting was very helpful. But if somebody doesn't want to moot, no issues. But you should do, you should get all those other things I told you from somewhere else though. You want to go out there and do something else, like hold a conference, right? Go, go to a, you don't have to speak at a conference, but you can contribute to a conference, right? With somebody. Do something which takes you out of your comfort zone and then you will learn a lot. Wow, sir. Uh, cool, sir. Uh, so Kuldeep has a question about COVID and the legal careers. Do you think, uh, what sort of short-term impacts can you see? What are the long-term, if any, uh, sort of impacts? Uh, and especially for the 2020 batch, you know, which is passing out yeah. this year. Uh, any, any piece of advice? Uh, and, yeah. I mean, there's going to be an impact on, on the 2020 batch, um, which is unfortunate. I think that it's only going to be short term, though, in my opinion. I think uh, any kind of uh, cutback plans of law firms is going to be based on the cutback plans of industries. Right? And that's kind of the, 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 the loop 
um, through which this happens. And I think once the industry revives, the, the law firms will revive as well. And, and so I, I think it's going to be short term, probably a year or so. It, it is going, there is going to be some churning right now, though, you know, and as, you, as the 2020 batch will already be seen. Um, but um, I, I think hopefully the, the impact will be short term. But there are some, um, there's a silver lining here. There are some uh, long term impacts as well, which is that people will start um, looking at the practice of law, hopefully differently. Uh, it'll be more efficient. Um, it'll be more based, not so much on um, uh, you sitting in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a uh, closet in office environment and doing your stuff. It could be that you could do the stuff from various locations. Uh, there'll be so much more flexibility to work uh, and so much more acceptance of that flexibility that's not there now, right? So it's very important that that, uh, and that will eventually help all the young lawyers who are going into the profession. Because uh, one of the things about this profession is you're expected to go and sit in court or sit in a law firm for hours, even if you're not being productive. And that will hopefully change. People are now uh, looking at what you produce rather than where you sit and produce it. And so that part of your work life, I think will change and it'll be for the better for all of us. Uh, sure, sir. Uh, so again, you know, we have a question. We we discussed about how to go about choosing an LLM program, but I think we, we have not handled the larger question, which is how do you go about choosing uh, an LLB degree college uh, in India? What sort of parameters you, uh, a young student should be looking at? A 17, 18 year. Quite quite similar to the LLM, except for the research part. So I think you need to look at the faculty mm -hmm. um, to see how serious and committed the faculty are to uh, the students. So an undergrad uh, undergrad education is very different from postgraduate education. An undergrad education requires the kind of pastoral uh, care that a postgraduate education doesn't require. So it's really important that they believe that the faculty is committed to um, legal education and to commit it to kind of nurturing and helping the students and helping them enjoy the law. I mean, it doesn't matter to me if, if, a, if we have a faculty who has done, who's written 20 articles in leading journals, but he's not able to incite passion in the student about the law. I mean, then there's no, uh, you know, he's not bringing value to the classroom. Right? So it's important for us that, um, that we have faculty who are, who are equally passionate about teaching and research. Research is important. Without research, no one can be a good teacher. Right? You, I mean, you can't have the, without doing, being a good researcher, you can't have a domain knowledge in order to be a good teacher. Right? But being a good teacher is very, very important. And by being a good teacher requires a lot of patience, a lot of commitment, and a lot of hard work, right? and a lot of genuine interest in the students. I mean, I find that lacking, by the way, in many law teachers. There's no genuine interest in ensuring that your class understands what's going on. And that, uh, for me, that's important. And then all the other usual stuff, good library resources, uh, uh, a good environment, a uh, good peer group, a good environment for them to be able to study. Some sense in the law faculty and the law management about where the students should go after law school, right? Some sense, as I said, I want to be wary of this transactional idea of saying that, these are all just machines, cogs in a wheel, you put them and then you throw them out. I don't want that. But there has to be some sense, some idea about where you want our law students to be five years down the line, right? What kind of skills they should possess, what kind of, how, what kind of value they should add to their uh, workspaces. So the, there should be some sense of that. So if you have that, all those, these, all these moving parts, good faculty, committed faculty, committed um, and some sense of purpose in the law school, I think it'll be a good law school to go to. Right, sir. Right. Uh, cool, sir. So, sir, I think we've we've reached uh, the end of time for, for this webinar. Uh, any parting? So you have you have delivered excellent advice on on various sort of topics. Uh, so, any final parting piece of advice for both for let's say the school students who are wanting to do law and people who are in law schools. Uh, yeah, I think, well, all right, parting piece of advice. All right, I'll give a parting piece of advice. Uh, I think, um, uh, please always keep this in mind that the skills that a law school teaches you are not easy to acquire, right? So they'll require a lot of patience on your part 
and a lot of patience on the part of the faculty. They can't be acquired in a day, they can't be acquired in a month, they can't be acquired in a year. There is a reason why law school is five years long, right? It's a reason. The reason is the kind of um, uh, slow burning approach to education, as we call it, you know, where we try to teach them how to think and write precisely, clearly, how to make sure they do things on time, how they make sure that they do things comprehensively, how they how to make sure that they bring out various pieces together in like in a jigsaw puzzle and put it together in an argument. These things take a lot of time. Right? And therefore be patient. You need, when you come into this, um, into this uh, law school ecosystem, you need to be patient. Uh, because you will not pick up the skills uh, quite easily. So that's, so, uh, hold on, that's just only part of my advice. The other more important part of my advice is while you're doing it, happiness and um, sense of joy in, uh, in these skills is most important, right? That attitude is more important. Don't worry about, you know, whether you'll succeed or fail. And those sort of things that, you know, you, first of all, they're mostly beyond your control. And secondly, they will just add to your misery. They do not really add value to what you're doing. What's important is you get a sense of contentment and joy and happiness in whatever you're doing. And I think if you get that, if you're able to just do that, uh, I think it'll be, a, it'll be a great, you'll have a great time at law school. Great, sir. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, sir, uh, for uh, all the answers and all the wisdom. Uh, I call it wisdom because a lot of it is is sometimes counterintuitive as well. Uh, very different from, let's say, what the young people are hearing nowadays. Uh, so, so thanks a lot. I personally gained uh, a lot of value out of this conversation. Uh, to everyone who has attended this session, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, I would also like to thank BML Munjal University for allowing me to host uh, Dr. Negam. Uh, so it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Tanuj. And thanks to everyone for who attended this. Uh, it was lovely uh, to be here today. Thank you. Take care.